So, good morning everyone. Lovely to be with you again on this Tuesday morning. I wish you a warm welcome to this Sangha Life space and this uh, community, this loving, caring, compassionate community, which I so much appreciate to come back to. And however you feel, uh, healthy or tired or yeah, a bit ruffled by life. You're just very much welcome this morning to be here, just as you are. Um, and my name is Suda König. I'm from southern Germany. I'm a Dharma. I'm a meditation. I'm a mindfulness teacher, of course, just as you. Much more, <laughs> much more than that as well. And today we're going to explore a very important concept in Buddhist teaching, which is clinging, tanha, thirst. And uh, there's so much misunderstanding about this concept that I'm really looking forward to this day today and to talk about what the Buddha said in the uh, his very first discourse about the characteristics and the understanding of what clinging actually is. And we're going to do it as follows. We're going, I'm going to talk for a, for a while <laughs> about this concept and um, the second noble truth which holds that concept, and then we're going to practice with it in meditation. And after that, we're going to have a couple of minutes time to share your questions, your reflections, or just as we did yesterday so beautifully, um, the teaching in the context of our lives, of our personal dukkha, and uh, to bring that together, which was really beautiful and much appreciated. Great. So if you want to share something, please use the chat box. Um, just as you do for your good morning wishes and everything, you can put something in capital letters, something like sharing or insight or question or anything really, um, and address the, the Sangha with this question. And I will, at the end of the session, find these snippets of information and, and uh, support you in reflecting upon it. And last thing to mention this morning is that these sessions are based on donation. So at the end of the session, um, you will find a link. And if you have the possibility, um, Matanga Live and myself uh, appreciates your support very much. So thank you for your support there. Okay, let's dive in. Today's session is called Reaction or response is natural. And I will explain to you in a minute why this is important. Um, to me, every single one of these noble truths, which we are currently exploring, brings with it some form of peace and freedom. So it's not that you have to go through all four, and then at the very end, if you master them all, you will get some experience of peace and freedom. No, it's like every mm, noble truth, Every noble perspective, we could also call them, brings with it, it's like a key which can unlock quite a lot of dukkha and bring some peace and freedom with it. We had it with the first noble truth. You remember, might remember the session in September we did together um, that we discovered, for example, that the dukkha we experience, whether it's um, the small dukkha of boredom and just friction with life and feeling not fully satisfied and or the, the challenges and the larger challenges, they are not a failure. Yeah, they are not a mistake. They are part of our life. We did not cause them. We did not want them. We did not invite them. And yet they are very much woven into the fabric of our experience. So unburden ourselves from the sense of guilt, from the sense of shame to say, whoa, I have a challenge, yeah, and then on top of that, bring the pressure of, and it's my fault, yeah, to say, no, 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 it belongs. That can be a bad message, or it can be a very relieving message, yeah, it belongs, yeah, we will continue to have to deal with sorts of challenges in our lives. And to acknowledge, and that is also a form of unburdenment, that we have some form of co-creation in our lives, but not full control. You can't control what is coming up. You can't control all the causes and conditions. There will be some you can address, and then there are other dynamics um, which are out of our control. Again, could be a bad message, could be a very relieving message. Mm. And finally, 
to know that imperfection and change is part of our life. Yeah, imperfection is just part of the fabric of life. We can work till the cows come home and we can't uh, bring things to perfection. Not our being in some sort of way, not our relationships, not our societies and not this planet. Yeah, which doesn't mean you know, just hear how we drop the baby with the bathwater at this point usually to say, okay, imperfection is not possible. Um, I'm just done with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to the other extreme. If, if perfection is not the goal, then it's not worth trying, yeah, to say something within us can appease with the okayness of the messiness, yeah, the okayness of the incomplete, imperfect, to say that is good enough, yeah. I find these are all potential liberations, potential forms of peace and freedom within the first noble truth. And today we take it a step further and we look into the potential of the second noble truth. I'm going to read it out to you today again, and then we see what we can, um, where we can squeeze the honey out. So there is a noble truth, second noble truth, the Buddha said, concerning the arising of suffering. A thirst for some, something to be in the future that is bound up, entangled, with relish and obsession, and is always running here and there. That is, thirst for sense input, thirst to be someone, thirst not to be someone. Fair question to ask, saying, Ulla, where is, <laughs> where is the peace and freedom here? I can't find it. Yeah, we need to dig a bit. So first of all, we're going to do an alchemical experiment today. Just imagine yourself to be a, a, a chemist or an, an our chemical master and to bring three potions together yeah in our first potion we have this first noble truth dukkha is part of all our lives the smaller and the larger challenges they continue first ingredient second ingredient we are all sensitive creatures we are impacted we reverberate with um, that which touches us experience through the eyes, through the ears, through body, through the mind, through all our sense doors, including the mind. So we are impacted by that which we experience. We're not stones and <clears throat> we, we swing with our experience. Second potion, sensitive nature of, of ours. And the third potion is that we all have a beautiful, natural, healthy intention yeah, to live and live well. Body, heart and mind work a lot to find ways to live and live well. So what happens if we put these three together? There is the dukkha, there is our sensitive nature, and there is our natural wish for a um, happy and well life. Whew. <clears throat> I would say what comes up naturally for me is reaction. Yeah? Reaction to dukkha. We are touched by the dukkha, up arises the natural intention out of our body, heart and mind to be well. And so there is reaction to dukkha. It shouldn't be this way. I want it to be different. Ouch, this hurts. But what are we going to do about that? Yeah. So dukkha creates a natural re reaction within, within us. It's not simply there, the challenge, yeah? but it also feels usually unpleasant. It feels unpleasant. And this unpleasantness is actually a signal, a signal to body, heart and mind to say, do something. Yeah. Now, for some practitioners, whether it's 2,600 years ago or these days, the attempt is always to avoid being touched by Dukkha. We want some form of armor. Yeah. We want to shut off uh, the Dukkha in our lives. But this would only be possible if we could lose our sensitive nature. Yeah, I don't want to echo. I don't want to resonate with experience anymore. I think we would lose a very precious thing. Yeah, we would use a very precious thing if we cut off our sensitive nature. We would use lose any form of um, empathy. We would lose any form of appreciation, mudita, any form of metta, which is all being touched by experience. It's much to do with that. Yeah. And I don't think that we 
will come to the agility to say, I will not be touched by Dukkha, but I can be touched by all the pleasant things. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I think that is, well, now we shift into the realm of uh, wishful thinking. Yeah, so maybe to cut off ourselves from experience is not the way to go. So we keep our sensitivity. And we keep our beautiful, lovely wish to live well. Yeah, this is something also often, often questioned in spiritual teachings and some form of interpretation of Buddhist teachings. Should we even strive to live well? Yeah, Should, is, is this already clinging? I hear a lot. Yeah, um, just look in, in, into how we're made up by evolution. Every being is made up by, by, by evolution, by this humble wish to say, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer. I want to live well, yeah. And when touched by something unpleasant, any being will have some sort of reaction and some sort of impulse to do something to avoid the suffering and to move towards the pleasant, yeah. And this makes so much sense because it secures our survival. Without this impulse, without this natural <coughs> alignment with some sort of okayness, contentment, happiness, uh, while living, we would not be able to survive. And um, we, we notice this in different forms in our lives. Um, it might be the lack of something, yeah, and that stirs up some reaction to say too little of something will destabilize the being in some way. Too little sleep, too little food, too little social connection, too little maybe appreciation within a group, which is just stabilizing my connection with others, yeah. So very natural that all these things will, will touch upon us and provoke a reaction. So we'll do overwhelm something, yeah? Our heart minds, our bodies, um, they react to, to too much of something, yeah? Saying withdraw, withdraw, it's too much. Yeah, get, get out of this situation. Too much, we can't handle that. Saying, okay, dear heart mind, I see you want to protect me. Thank you. And also challenging rela relational situations. I think we need to include them into the picture, the interrelational dukkha, I like to call it. Others are not always safe, and they haven't been in the past. I've read in a, a somewhere is a statement that um, back, back, back in time when, when people still lived on, in, in, in uh, caves and such things, um, science assumes that um, it weren't the predator animals that were, were the biggest uh, uh, challenge or risk for a human being. It was actually other human beings. So <clears throat> they find themselves in, I find, in a terrible dilemma, saying, alone I can't survive, I need my group, I need my tribe. But at the same time, the biggest challenge or risk for my life are not the saber-toothed tigers or the, the mammoths or something, it's actually other human beings. So. We have this ambivalence almost to each others to say others are not fully safe and at the same time unheed them. Yeah. And here we find how interrelational dukkha can whew, stir us up a lot and how much, how important to the heart mind this sense of connection and safety with each other is important. Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. So here, all that sort, different sort of dukkha, too little, too much on the interrelational dukkha, and of course, everything else you can come up with, stirs up a reaction. And I find this natural, I find this healthy and appropriate. We have, what, what comes up for me is then needs, desires and wishes. Humble, normal, natural needs, desires and wishes. And this is not yet clinging. The Buddha had another word for that, he called that chanda. Yeah, a natural wish for something. And without these needs and desires and wishes, we would definitely suffer more. We would not properly take care of this body, heart and mind. We would sort of neglect it. Yeah. So they are an important information system. Yeah. To say, okay, great. I recognize a need. I recognize a desire. I recognize a wish. There is some important piece of information in that. But at times you will see, and now we're drawing the bridge from the desire, the need, the wish, from the chanda to the clinging. Yeah. Sometimes you will need and um, notice how these needs and desires almost harden, crystallize 
into something we call cling. <coughs> um, so the more intense the experience of dukkha, the more the whole system is on alarm already. Yeah, Maybe based on a past experience of too little or past experience of too much or past experience of not safe with others. Yeah, That stirred up the whole system already and it's on edge yeah it says oh this can happen again so the next dukkha comes in and it almost overcharges in its reaction yeah so the more intense the experience of the dukkha or the shadow of the past the more likely it is that a natural wish a natural desire a natural need will charge over into clinging into some form of hardening crystallizing the buddha called it tanha thirst and we will lose our coolness, we will lose our stability, our equanimity with our wishes and needs. It changes into clinging. And now comes what I wish to share with you today. Um, the Buddha had a beautiful definition of what actually clinging is, how we can actually recognize, differentiate a, a, a need, a wish, a desire from actual clinging. And he had this sentence, I read it out, I read it out again for you. A thirst for something to be in the future that is bound up with relish and obsession and is always running here and there. Let's untangle that. A clinging has, has these characteristics. The first he mentions is a thirst for something to be in the future. So a clinging is usually directed to the future. We In the moment a clinging arises or hardens, um, we use our okayness with this moment. It can't stay like this. This moment is not fulfilling. It's not um, what I'm supposed. I'm not what I'm supposed to. This moment is not what it's supposed to. Yeah. There's an urge towards changing what is. Yeah. Either by planning ahead or trying to get rid of something which we feel belongs to this moment, either in our persona or in the outer circumstances, and we want it to be different from what is right now. And some some sort we can say the present moment has lost its peacefulness, has lost its substance, its nourishment for us. It needs to be different. So we're almost leaning, leaning away from this moment. First characteristic. Second characteristic is raga. And raga is a form of obsession, fascination with something. The mind is almost collapsing, zooming in. Uh, narrowing in on a certain idea, a theme, a challenge, a problem. Yeah, it becomes very narrow-minded. That can be positive things and that can be negative experiences. That can be um, a goal we set for ourselves and then all the day long, the mind just like saying, am I there yet? Am I there yet? How do I get there? What else could I do to accomplish that? Whatever it is. And all other things kind of lose their appeal. Yeah? They are just like kind of nuisances on our way to get what uh, we think will be fulfilling. And it can be the negative as well. For example, if we, um, if it's something about a persona, uh, you might notice this. It, let's, for example, say uh, I'm such a bad, I'm not good enough in... I'm not good enough. Yeah, <laughs> just let, let keep, let's keep it like that, broad and open. I'm not good enough. So the mind f focuses in, the, um, narrows in on this theme, and it will put into reference everything with this assumption. Am I good enough yet? What does this say about my good enoughness? Yeah. Oh, this is a confirmation of my good enough, of my not good enoughness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything evolves around this one theme, one challenge, yeah, a form of obsession, fascination in the positive and in the negative. You will notice this very well um, as soon as you try to bring your attention to something else. It's almost like a sticky, <laughs> sticky kill. Like it, the mind goes back, palm back to this one theme. Yeah, it takes a lot of effort to get it away from there and suck back is it uh, with this theme. Then we have Nandi. Um, which is a form, the third characteristic, actually something almost beautiful. It um, translates, translates as relish and joy. Yeah. 
to say Klinge is usually characterized by this idea that the future, once we achieved the change uh, from the present moment to the desir more desirable um, future, there will be a form of joy, satisfaction, or at least relief, got rid of this. So, oh, relief, yeah. And we usually buy into the illusion of when I get this, when I am like this, when I have this, when I experience this, everything will be all right, yeah, problem solved. It's we tap again and <clears throat> again and again into this idea of then to cover land. Yeah, and so there's this illusion of relish and joy, uh, which comes with the clinging. And the final one is like the Buddha said, the mind is always running here and there. And that is something you can almost, when in practice, sitting in meditation, beautifully observe. The hard mind is agitated. It's unsettled, it's fragmented, it's charged. It doesn't settle easily with something as simple as the breathing. It needs to go left, right and center. It needs to think about something, it wants to do something. The whole being is charged up. You might actually feel this. I can feel this physically, this tanha, this clinging. When my body is leaning towards something, it feels pushed, pulled. Yeah, The qualities of thoughts and attention is different. So these four qualities I wanted to share with you today because I find it very important that we differentiate between a natural, healthy, beautiful, appropriate reaction to dukkha. You know, to say, of course, dukkha creates uh, a reaction within us. We are sensitive creatures and we want body, heart and mind want us to do well. But we keep a little attention and an eye on that these natural, beautiful needs and wishes do not harden and crystallize into clinging, tanha, thirst, the Buddha called them. And the four characteristics he shared would be a leaning into what's the future, a form of zooming in and obsessing about a theme, a problem, a challenge, the idea that the end of that challenge, of that problem, of that goal, will bring fine, um, infinite relish and joy, things will be settled then, and almost a physical ability to feel that state out, an agitated, unsettled, fragmented charge within the heart mind. So if you feel like that, practice to differentiate between these two over the course of the day, and maybe you find, uh, find that you can see a difference and differentiate between your healthy needs and clinging. Okay. And maybe we even can do that in meditation right now. Enough of the words. Let's bring it to practice. Find yourself a comfortable seat. Maybe uh, lean back in your chair or find yourself a cushion. You could stand up or lie down. And we're not trying to let go of suffering. We're not trying to let go of clinging. We want to explore a little bit how to let things be. No need to put pressure on yourself this morning to let go of any of that. We take it a step back. We allow things to be this morning. So we could start being with this body this morning. Observe its posture, observe the different physical sensations this morning. And just see how quickly the mind reacts to maybe tight places, achy places. Maybe it has an image of good posture. And how the mind can make all these suggestions for things to be different.
And this morning the invitation is to not to have to do any of that. To notice the suggestions for improvement. Maybe thank the, heart, the mind to say, do you mind thank you for letting me know what we could do. But right now we're just gently, kindly, warmly observing this body, saying good morning, hello dear one. Maybe you notice that the body can do the work on its own. It will unravel like a crinkled sheet of paper. Slowly, slowly by itself. There's no need for you to do that. Allow your mindfulness, invite your mindfulness the way you are aware of the body to have a very soft and open and broad touch to it. So that there is no pushing and pulling, no pressure even in aware of being, in a way of being aware of experience of our body. At times we can notice that experiencing some of the unpleasant, maybe the agitation within the fragmentation can cause up a little unwellness, maybe even a small anxiety. Can I hold this? Can I be with this? The heart mind might feel a bit threatened. We gently talk to it, saying it's okay. We can hold it in a large field of awareness. We don't need to go too close. We don't need to figure it out.
you might notice the tendency to zoom in, to narrow in on the challenging, the unpleasant, right here. See how the heart mind wants to move to that which is unpleasant, to keep it under control, to keep it in check, to understand it, to solve it, to say, dear heart mind. Can we lean back a little bit? Allow it to stay there, this unpleasant sensation, experience within your body. And there is also maybe the feet on the floor, feeling your weight on the cushion, the chair. Leaning back into whatever support you have. Noticing the spaciousness around you. Maybe you also notice that something in the being feels fast, jumpy, fragmented. Maybe the attention tends to hop. Maybe there's a flickering in the mind or in behind the eyes. And rather than to try to slow that down on purpose, can you also be aware of physical sensations, any sensations which have a steadiness, a groundedness, an earthiness to them? Maybe there is a slow rhythm in the breath or steadiness of just feet on the ground. And with it, maybe this relief of not having to do anything right now or to go anywhere. Let it be, let it be this form of agitation, fragmentation, speed. Allow it to have its place in the current of experience and every now and then find something steady, slow, grounded to be aware of.
maybe you can notice how you're leaning away from this moment. Maybe leaning into what comes next in your day. Maybe leaning into a theme, a problem, a challenge, which is almost calling you, like having little hooks and carrying you away into thinking about it, being with it. <coughs> can you feel, can you find something just like this moment, coming home, coming home? Something which feels like arriving, like softening into this moment. It's okay. Not for a long, dear heart mind. We're going to take care of this later. But for just now, I give myself permission to root, root, root round into this moment. It's okay enough. might not be very clear what we're leaning into. It could just be this sense of being pulled away from this moment, as if something is calling you. It might be more a physical experience rather than something clear. And I invite you to just make yourself comfortable, as comfortable as possible, whether you're standing, lying down, sitting. Maybe there is some relief, some lightness in allowing these things to be. The quickness of the unsettled heart mind, the calling, the allure, the hooks of what we should be, should do, should think about, should solve, and allowing them all to be there, and yet finding some earthiness, some groundedness. Some calm and ease and space in this moment. This is there too. I can allow all these things to be and connect with the calmness, the ease, the steadiness of the just this moment.
And if nothing of that is possible for you this morning, don't feel frustrated. Maybe this is even more so a reason for compassion to say, wow, there's a large echo to the challenges, the demands, the pressures in my life. Oh, dear body, dear heart, mind, this is suffering. This is hard. Hmm. May you be well. May you experience moments of freedom from this tension, this agitation. May you experience moments of lightness and ease. May your body, heart and mind feel safe enough, nourished enough, connected enough to come back into a state of calm and ease. And then we gently start moving our bodies, our hands and feet. Maybe some yawning and some stretching. And when you feel ready, you can open up your eyes and come back to the screen. So I wonder how this went for you. I wonder whether you have any questions on today's session. Maybe... You have some familiarity with the clinging now that we have these four criteria. Anything coming up for you where you notice, oh yeah, actually I'm I'm very familiar with clinging. Uh, I know this allure of this leaning into the future. I know how raga, how the obsession feels like. I know how my mind tricks me again and again with this belief, with this hope for if I get this, if I have this, if I be like this. Things will be settled once and for all, and how this can lead to a state of puffing, push, pot, fragmented. Yeah, and and we also know the difference to that, don't we? We know what a healthy desire, a healthy wish, a healthy need feels like. So maybe you have any familiarity with that or questions. So please feel free to respond, or maybe something which came up during the meditation for you. Happy to talk with you about that. While you write write and reflect, I would like to uh, share with you that I have an upcoming day of practice on the 4th of November, which I want to invite you to. And I'll just post the link. We're going to talk about change. Um, maybe just a few couple of words. How are you doing? So Holly is writing. That was great to have a clinging map and the invitation to bring steadiness to it rather than to make it stop. Yeah, my mind loves obsessing. Yeah, mine too, Holly. Um, I just actually find it so fascinating. As soon as one obsession with something stops, it is just capable of bringing up a new theme. So I just, uh, rather than saying the theme is the problem, um, uh, it, it's the habit of the mind to to obsess, yeah, to, to just like really wanting to go into something and to to, uh, gnaw on something and to be um, filled up with something, yeah? And I notice sometimes, at least just out of my experience, this is um, also fueled by a sense of, oh, intense, a wish for intensity, a feeling not fully well with things just being meh, like (laughs) mediocre, yeah? So my mind does not like mediocrity, so it wants intensity, it wants allure, it wants fascination, it wants complexity 
And that, of, of course, then <laughs> happily gives into some form of obsession as well. So some of our minds might, even in this map of clinging, have a tendency towards one aspect more than others. Lovely. So happy that this map worked for you. Christian is writing, yesterday and today have really solidified how important and self-compassion is yeah, when we speak to the chitta. Yes, Christian, thank you so much. Compassion, I said it with the first noble truth, I think is um, almost like one of the backbones of our practice. Yeah, because um, it, takes, it takes shame and to a large degree guilt out of the picture. You can just say, I can't understand where this is coming from. I can see why that is a natural reaction, but dear heart, mind, we are in overshoot. <laughs> we are in overshoot, and this is harm. This is going to bring harm to us. And this is a caring reaction rather than a shaming one. So, Gwen is writing technical question. How do I listen to the replay this morning when it is posted somewhere after 20 minutes? Oh, Gwen, dear one, I don't know that. I'm not familiar with the technical side of it. I'm not sure whether George is with us. But he might um, he might post it within the next couple of hours. I hope so. Maybe someone else in the sangha knows more about the the replays. Steph is writing. I find it really helpful to put space around the dukkha. It's, it's often in my body, and I can get some relief. Yeah, beautiful. Just as um, we heard from uh, Holly, not having to stop the dukkha, not having to stop the clinging. Yeah. Um, to having to do the impossible of the moment um, uh, actually brings some relief. It is allowed to be there. It is allowed to be there. It has its place. And all we can do sometimes is to, to do, decide how much space we need to put around it for it to almost like be acceptable in this present moment. Sometimes it's it, I can't make it go away. I can't make it stop. I can't solve. I can't solve it. I can't even fully distract myself from it. But what I can do maybe is lean back enough and include enough other experiences, spaciousness around me, here is the body, um, here I hear the bird song, yeah, space, 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 space. And then I can allow this unpleasantness to, to be there. Great. Tanya's writing. She found it very helpful to keep grounding my attention in the body, working with pain in the body and not wanting it to be there, interpersonal dukkha, people not being as I would want them to be. Yeah, the mind never stops, but there was ease in coming back to the body with warmth and kindness. Yeah. And now we can maybe see, Tanya, why um, it's so difficult in the beginning. Because everything you just mentioned, physical pain, interpersonal dukkha, um, some, when I'm wanting something to be there, that everything charges up, saying problem, problem, alarm, alarm. Yeah, I need to solve that. I need to think about that. I need to improve my experience. Of course, the heart mind wants to do that. And we bring it back and bring it back to this little small okayness of this moment, and it will refuse in the beginning. It can even throw a temper tantrum, saying, what do you want from me? You want to show me my feet on the floor, and that should be enough? And the body and the, and the heart mind resists that. So the warmth and the kindness and this little loving, caring persistence in it. Yeah, to say, yeah, come, come, come and look again. Yeah, come and see what alternative there is to trying to solve and improve and obsess about that. Yeah, and it needs time and it needs patience. Mm. Laura writes, your explanation is very clear for me. My son who has mental problems diagnosed as schizophrenic is obsessed with his values and asks me and others about without stopping. We talk a lot. He's not interested in meditating, but can you suggest a way I can help him? Hmm. Challenging one. And maybe we need a personal conversation, Laura. My guess is just a wild guess at this point is to say when I'm obsessed with values, yeah, um, I want to get a map for this word. Yeah. If it would, if this word would work, yeah, relationships would work with clear values. I would have a map of some sort of right, left, right, do this, not do that, yeah, and things would feel, be clearer, yeah, it can't be, but it's so much more complex and overwhelming at times for all of us. So maybe underneath this need, this urge, this thirst for clear values, there is like really an overwhelm and also a fearfulness to get things wrong, like to do the wrong things, say the wrong th um, things, and address this complexity in a way which is then ca causing further stress, further pressure, further conflict, etc. 
And maybe that can be a trust to say, oh, dear one, I noticed this is like really overwhelming from the complex. And for me, is it is as well. Yeah. And what I usually do with this complexity and overwhelm is etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Not even meditating, but what but how how are you responding to it? Just giving the question back. <laughs> and feel free to contact me for personal conversations if you have like bigger things which we can't uh, clarify here. Ruth is saying I lost my temper big time last night with my family. It was so helpful to hold this today in a larger space to understand and bring compassion to the circumstances that led to the explosion. How it combined with my sensitive nature, my good intention, beautifully. Ruth. Yeah, that is the relief to say, I'm really sad. I'm even grieving that this happened. Yeah, I can notice that there was so much in the picture, just as you said, like all the circumstances and all the conditions. And one of it was good intention. And I, it's beautiful that you're aware of that. You have to say, yes, there was the good intention. And it wasn't enough in that moment. With all the other dynamics and conditions going on, it wasn't enough to uh, maneuver it into a different direction. And um, maybe to grieve that and to be really yeah, to really feel the sadness of that for a while, to bring in the compassion. And when all that subsided, that it might be the small insight to say, okay, next time, the, the small mm, yeah, thing I can maybe contribute next time might be etc. And to bring that, uh, or that, that might get out of it, like the golden nugget to take from that situation. Thank you Ruth, for sharing that. Clive is asking whether I could slowly repeat the second noble truth. I'm going to do something different, Clive. I'm going to put it into the chat box for you to read once, twice, never. <laughs> okay. Where are we here? Tanya is writing to Quen. Um, oh, yeah. Tanya has written, written to Quen about the Sangha uh, replace. Yeah, Jane, the small little okayness. <laughs> um, she loved that phrase, and that is it. And sometimes just notice how the mind is not ready for that and how we have to invite it and invite it back to that. Heidi is writing that this morning teachings res resonate with her. Lovely just to allow the clinging protection into the future. Yeah, sitting back and listening to the rain on the conservatory roof. Beautiful. There is it. There is the clinging and the projecting into the future. And there's the rain, yeah. And here we have this lovely connection to say, yes, it's there. And in the safety of our cushion, in the safety of our meditation, it can discharge slowly and surely with the help of the rain on the roof. Yeah, Alison is writing for her too. Um, she found it easier to come into the body, but al allowing the mind to be there in the background. Yeah. Yeah, not, neither the one nor the other, neither only body or only mind, but bringing the ant into the play. Catherine's writing, she realizes she can be very goal orientated in a way that is a bit obsessional in relation to achievements, exercise, state of health, being good enough, daughter, parent, etc. Yeah, the aspirations are not in themselves bad, but I want to relate to them with less dukkha. Beautiful that you saw that. Now, here we have the difference between a healthy desire, a healthy wish. If there was no chanda, no healthy desire, what sense would practice make? <laughs> of course, we all wish to develop into less suffering. Yeah? So that is appropriate. And now the way we relate to that change, the way we relate to that practice, training, development, that makes all the difference. If it becomes pressured, if it becomes like, my good enoughness, my sense of worth, my sense of um, who I am, who I will be in this world is depending on that change. It becomes narrow, it becomes pressured. And this is what we're going to talk about in the next couple of days. We're going to talk about three types of thirst the Buddha suggested. The thirst for experience to have, the thirst for us to be in some way, different from what we are right now, and the thirst for not to be, not to be that person, not to be in that role, not to be, not to be. Yeah. And um, these were the thirsts, the clinging thirsts the Buddha suggested. And I think, um, Catherine, what you shared with us here is exactly this, transferring a healthy wish to a clinging, a contraction. Yeah. 
So maybe um, that is something to feel out. What? How can I feel out lightness around achievements, lightness around goals and qualities I wish to come into my life? Yeah, and to explore that. Okay. So thank you for all those beautiful, nourishing contributions. So happy that you shared with us and make, made this session so much richer. And we're going to, mo to look tomorrow into this first thirst um, thirst to have an experience, which is so natural to our minds, and to differentiate that from healthy needs and healthy wishes and desires. And uh, yeah, looking forward to be with you tomorrow again. Thank you for coming.